So hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming to this session. Uh, when, uh, when we did uh, DockerCon uh, last June, one of the feedback to the conference is uh, we want more like deeply technical black belt session. I think you won't be disappointed by this one. So today we have uh, Andrei Sibiryov, uh, who is infrastructure in engineer uh, at Uber. And he's going to uh, tell us about how to do kernel load balancing for Docker containers. Uh, using IPVS. Thanks. Andre? Hey. Oh, so I talk to this microphone, right? Cool. So, uh, yeah, my name is Andre. I work in Uber. I work in infrastructure. I'm a bulldozer operator. That means I can uh, kind of land things with the ground and then build something new on top of that, which is pretty cool. And today we're going to talk about the uh, load balancing for Docker containers because as far as I know, it's not really kind of the area that is well explored. So, uh, yeah. Uh, probably you shouldn't really trust me because you shouldn't really trust anybody on this stage and you should actually get your hands dirty and try it out for yourself after the talk. But you still probably should trust me because I turned 30 last month, so I'm trustworthy now. And uh, I've been building these kind of things like infrastructures and networks and computers, containers and all that kind of stuff for like last seven years. And uh, I think the systems that I was involved with, uh, they still function and serve like billions of requests a day, which is, I think, good enough for me to be kind of, I don't know, be here and talk about things. So, uh, have anybody actually heard about IPVS? Oh, that's like the forest of hands. That's pretty good. This guy heard like a lot, I think. <laughs> so, I've, uh, so not, not many people actually know about it, and I've, I thought like, why? why? Why nobody knows about it? It's like, it's, it's in the kernel for like 15 years. So I tried to Google for IPVS with cleaning up my like cookies and everything, and that's like, like I'm like I'm not a nerd. Just Google for IPVS, right? So apparently it's about pigs. <laughs> it's uh, International Pig Veterinary Society, and these guys are pretty active, much more active than us, right? So uh, see, they have many congresses around the world, and apparently the uh, vice president of this IPVS is a guy from Barcelona. <laughs> so, but this is, we, we won't talk about this kind of animals today. So we're gonna talk about different animals, which is this, right? So IPVS is a IP virtual server. And actually this guy, if you don't know, this, this is the favorite penguin of Linus Torvalds. This is how the uh, tux, the penguin that you all know about actually appeared. It was drawn based on this guy. So, uh, yeah, IPVS. It's part of a Linux Virtual Server project, which is a part of Linux HA, which is Linux High Availability Project. And apparently, actually, a lot of companies in the world use it. These are the companies that I know of, which actually use IPVS to load balance things in their infrastructures. And I, I worked in Yandex, for example, and we used IPVS to route basically all the traffic in, in our data centers using IPVS. And this technology was around for more than 15 years. It was in mainland kernel starting with uh, 2.628, I think, or 2.632, something like that. Uh, so it's a long time ago. And it was tested with fire and water and breast and bones and everything possible, and it, it works. So what is it? Uh, so IPVS is a kernel load balancer. Uh, it works inside Linux kernel, so it's not a user space process or something like that. It's a module for kernel. Uh, it is based on that filter, which was around for a, a lot of years as well. Uh, it plugs in even before pickup layer. So you, for example, can't do TCP dump and see what's going on in the IPVS load balancer. And it is done so, so that uh, the speed that it can achieve is extremely fucking fast. Sorry for my language. But it's true. Uh, it supports TCP, it supports UDP, it supports IPv6, IPv4, it even supports SCTP, which is a protocol that nobody uses, but it's actually pretty cool as well. 
It supports a lot of different modes for uh, load balancing. It can do all, all the things that you all know about, like weighted run dropping, weighted list connections, and source hashing, destination hashing, like everything you probably already seen in things like HEProxy or some other load balancers. Uh, but the cool thing about it is that unlike all, uh, not all, but the majority of all the other balancers out there is that it's not a proxy, it's a forwarder. So uh, it works on layer four of the OSI model and it supports basically three ways of forwarding your packets from the clients to your backends, which is NAT, which you probably know about anyway. Uh, another way is tunneling and direct routing. I will talk about this later. So it's just like an overview of, of things it can do. Uh, it also supports uh, address bundling with firewall mark. Firewall mark is something that you can set with IP tables when the packet comes into your network stack. You can say that if it, the source IP is that or something else, then set the mark to three, for example. And then you can route packets based on this mark as kind of an ID of a packet. And yeah, it's fast. So uh, it also supports, supports things like one packet mode, which is uh, basically a way to load balance DNS, for example, which usually people don't think that DNS is something that you load balance, but I can tell you that actually it is. And sometimes it's something that is required like a lot. So a little bit more about this NAT tunneling and direct routing. Uh, I, I've, I've drawn these diagrams, and this is actually pretty terrible, I think, but still, probably you can see these letters, right? Can you see it? Yeah, cool. So uh, the modes that IPVS can use to load balance your stuff. So the first mode is IPIP, which is tunneling. So basically, the idea of tunneling is pretty simple. The client, this computer in the bottom, sends a packet to your load balancer box. And load balancer takes this packet and encapsulates it in another IP packet and sends this forward to, to one of the backends and picks based on one of the uh, load balancing methods. And this uh, backend box unpacks the packet from this encapsulated packet. And well, it will see actually that the packet is addressed for some other box, not, not, not this one. It will basically drop it on the floor. And to alleviate that issue, we set up another interface on all the backend boxes, which has the same IP address as the balancer, but this other interface is non-arpable, so it won't actually announce the address in the network. So by doing that, we will basically ensure that these backend boxes will unpack the packet and see that, oh, this is actually my IP address as well, so I'll just process this packet and send it back to the user. And that's the important part. As you see in this picture, the response doesn't go through a load balancer. The response goes directly back to the client. And this is a very unique feature of IPVS because it basically makes you be able to cut traffic in half for the load balancer box. And that actually is the, one of the main reasons why IPVS is so fast. Uh, another mode is like usual NAT. So this mode is here basically for people who are lazy and don't want to configure anything at all. So it works like any other NAT. It basically rewrites the, the destination IP address of the uh, client request and sends it to one of the backend boxes. And the only thing about NAT with IPVS is that it's only destination NAT. It doesn't rewrite the source. So if you don't configure anything at all, then the packet will travel back from the backend box to the client, but the, the, the uh, source app address won't match the TCP session on the client, so the packet will be dropped on the floor. So to fix that, we basically set up all the backend boxes in such a way that the default gateway for them is the balancer. So they all send packets to the balancer, and IPVS and the balancer already knows about what's going on, so it will rewrite the address in the proper way, and the packet will travel to the client in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the proper way as well. And the last mode of operation, the uh, DSR, which is direct server response, or an other, other, other name for that is DR, which is direct routing, is kind of the same as IPIP, as, as a tunneling, but with a twist. The, the idea about direct routing is that instead of uh, encapsulating packets or rewriting IP addresses, something like that, we rewrite the MAC address of the packet. So one requirement for that is that all the boxes, like all the backends, all the load balancers should be in one L2 segment. They have to be basically addressable by MAC addresses. But the good part about that is that IPVS doesn't have to do anything at all, basically. You just need to rewrite the MAC address, and that's it. 
And the packet will basically be forwarded as is to the backend box, which was chosen by the load balancing method. And then it will travel directly back to the client as well, like in IPIP. But there is no encapsulation, decapsulation, so it's like, it's super fast. And to prove that it's actually super fast, I did a little bit of uh, kind of benchmarking, right? So uh, I did it on MySQL for no reason at all. And this is how it looks like. So I, I'm actually bad with computers, so I couldn't do these two lines, different colors. So they're, they're both blue. So, uh, but still you can see that the, the first, like the light blue line is the uh, direct connection to MySQL server without any load balancers or anything at all. And the dark blue line is a connection with direct routing. And you can see that it's virtually the same. There is no loss of performance at all. And for comparison, there is this uh, yellow line, which is, a, which is H proxy, and it's about 40% slower than IPVS connections, which is, I think, is pretty awesome. Oh yeah, one more thing about the tunneling. One other downside of the tunneling is that because it's tunneled and encapsulated, the MTU will be lower, so you have to account for this additional IP header, which is probably not a problem at all. So you would prob you'd probably sit here right now and you're like, uh, we don't need this. Why the hell are we talking about this, man? Go off the stage. So uh, actually, it's a pretty cool technology. So everybody, everybody needs load balancing and everybody needs routing because uh, apparently everybody has more than one app and more than one server and more than one version of, of, of an app. So uh, if you have more than one instance, you need load balancing because otherwise there is no other way to kind of distribute the load between the instances. And if you have more than app, more than one app, or more than one version of one app, then you have to do some routing because otherwise there's no way to distribute the log between versions. And imagine what you can do if you could deploy like 142 versions of something into production, right? It would be super, super awesome because then you can do things like A-B testing, which is like not super exciting, or you can do like honeypotting, right? So for example, if the source IP address of the packet is from the NSA network, then root them to this porn site instead of our backend or whatever, right? Or if, if uh, some header matches something, then we can root this 1% of the users to a special version with 100% more ads so that we could make more money, right? So that's how startups work. So this, in general, the technology is actually useful, the load balancing and uh, the routing. But you can ask me like, okay, so why do we need IPVS, we have Nginx and HProxy and VulkanD and Hypeche and whatever else, right? It, it's all kind of there and it already works, so we don't need that. So, uh, first of all, in modern world with Docker containers and Swarm and orchestration, everything like that, instances come and go and they come and go sometimes even more, like even faster than once a second. So, instances migrate across the physical nodes and instances can be spun up or tore down because of the load growth or because the load goes down, right? So well, one problem with Nginx and HProxy, for example, is that they don't really allow you to dynamically configure the backends. So there are a lot of hacks around it, like you can do like config file regeneration based on console, puppet, whatever, but there is no, it's, it's, like, it's like ad hoc and it's not really uh, reliable or sustainable. And yeah, in Azure Proxy, you can, for example, change the weights of the backends, but it's not enough. And for example, another thing is Hypeche, which is a load balancer written in Node.js, so apparently there is no reason to talk about it at all, right? Because it's Node.js. Oh, have you heard of this joke? So like every, everything, in, uh, everything in Clojure is a list, and everything in Ruby is an object, and everything in JavaScript is a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Hypache out, out of the list. Um, Vulkan D is actually something that Jerome told me about, about like two weeks ago. So uh, yeah, it looks promising, but it's still in like pre-production beta alpha stage or whatever. And for some reason, it doesn't support anything except round robin. I don't know why. Maybe it's just still in development or something like that. So yeah, the, these things are options, but they, they all lack something that is kind of important, as I, as I understand that. But you can say that 
whatever, man, we don't even use Nginx and HProxy, whatever. We run everything in AWS and it just solves all the problems for us. We don't need to do anything at all. We just sit and relax, right? So just whatever. Uh, well, cloud is cool, maybe, but uh, you'll like if you run things in the cloud, actually, because sometimes there are performance requirements which cloud can't actually alleviate. Sometimes there are reliability requirements. Sometimes you run exotic hardware. Sometimes you need CUDA. Sometimes you run BSD. Sometimes you need computer graphic clusters or whatever. And actually, clouds are not a commodity in the world. It's like in the United States or Europe, yeah, you can do like AWS spin up an instance and it just works. But for example, if you're in Vietnam, which is actually have a thriving anti-culture, then AWS kind of doesn't really exist there. So uh, it's not an option there as well. And there are security considerations. There is a vendor lock-in. And apparently, actually, load balancers that are kind of, uh, th that exist in the cloud infrastructure, like AWS or GCE, they are actually pretty dumb. So for example, in uh, Elastic Load Balancer, you can't really pick a load balancing method. It's only like round robin, that's it. And health checks, HTTP or TCP, that's it. There's nothing else. And yeah, AWS kind of becomes expensive if you're not Netflix. So it's not really an option sometimes as well. So I draw this little picture, like table, with comparison between things. This might be a lie, so I don't know, verify the fact. Uh, this is how you can kind of distribute the load balancers, the, the common things. So as you can see that Nginx and HProxy, they, they function on la layer seven of the OCM model, and AWS and AppVS, they function on la layer four. And they all can kind of do TCP, except Nginx, which is kind of HTTP only, not TCP. Only IPVS can do UDP load balancing, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, dynamic configuration. In Nginx, it's only rewrite the configuration file, restart Nginx, reload. In HProxy, it's kind of there because you can change weights. In AWS, it's kind of there because you can use API. In IPVS, it's there because you can just do it. Uh, there are four winning methods, which is four in case of IPVS, and there is uh, basically none in other load balancers because they don't forward anything, they just do proxying. And the load, the, uh, the, the load balancing methods, the number of load balancing methods in other balancers is lower. It's not actually a very cool thing because Probably you don't need some special weird load balancing method, but still, sometimes you need it and it doesn't exist in, for example, HProxy, and that's it. You have to either patch C or just do, don't do it at all. And yeah, health checks, they kind of exist everywhere except Nginx, unless you pay for it, right? But nobody pays for Nginx, even Netflix. So uh, it's kind of a cool thing. IPVS is a cool thing. So you probably maybe want to know how do you actually use it because I know it's a kernel thing, right? All kernel things are like these special technologies from space and there is no, you think people don't have any idea how to actually use it because oh, I mean, it's magic, we don't touch the kernel, right? So uh, to help with this, I wrote a tool, especially for this talk. Uh, it's called GORB, Go Routing and Balancing. This is a core code that will probably lead you to the GitHub repo, I'm not sure. Or maybe it's a Uber Jobs website, I can't remember. It's one of these two. But. So uh, it's on GitHub. It's a REST API daemon to control IPVS. So basically, uh, I took these Netlink calls and all this magical kernel stuff that is going on there and wrapped it up in a nice, stupid, but loyal daemon that will serve you good if you want to use it. It exposes a very simple REST API, like you can get backends or virtual servers, you can register new ones, you can delete them. Uh, it also supports Docker natively, so you can use it with Docker containers without actually doing anything special. It supports TCP health checks, HTTP health checks, and uh, maybe some other health checks in the future. And uh, this last bullet point, I'll talk about it later, but I think that's how we all supposed to actually load balance things in Docker. So uh, it's pretty early stage, obviously. I wrote it like one week ago, so it lacks a lot of features. 
And for, for, for example, it doesn't support direct routing yet. It's only, uh, only tunneling or NAT. It doesn't support firewall marks. It doesn't support this and that. But it's kind of primitive but functioning. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. And uh, yeah, the Docker containers and MacVillan and everything like that, the last bullet point. So uh, like usually when you want to load balance something into your containers, you probably use something like HProxy or Nginx. You put it in front, and you do use some kind of console or etcd or whatever, and then you register your backends and the, some script will generate the config file for HProxy or Nginx, and this will do the load balancing magic for you. So uh, it kind of works, but it's slow. And I mean, usually it's OK for small, kind of small startups or small companies. But when the load rises, then you actually start to care about speed and performance. And that where, that, that's the actual time when the IPVS comes into play. So I think that a good idea would be to use a thing called MacVillan. So basically, right now, Docker, without the new modern network plugins, it will register the uh, bridge for you and will bind your containers on the virtual Ethernet interface. So since now we have network plugins, and actually people actually start to write these network plugins already. So like we, we saw Tor plugin here like about one hour ago, two hours ago. So uh, I've already seen that people, people wrote the MacVillan plugin, which will allow you to bind your containers on a bridge and assign them a separate MAC addresses to each of the containers. So that first of all, all the containers can actually have a real IP address. And the second of all, your containers could be routed using DR, which is the fastest way to load balance ever. So uh, it should be a pretty cool thing, I think. I actually never tried it yet. But I tried to use Docker and GORB and IPVS to use NAT routing. And I'm actually going to demo this right now. Right? Maybe it will work. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, how to do that? Computers. Yep. OK. Uh, it's not, 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 not really cool, right? Anyway, so uh, I use Docker machine for that. So you can see that there is one machine, the default machine. Oh, I'm doing that. The default machine is running. Can you hear me, right? Yeah? yeah? Cool. So the, what? Oh, OK. So uh, the default machine is running. I didn't really do anything to it. It's just like standard Docker machine that, will, that, that, that is generated by default when you, when you install Docker machine. So uh, let's do. So nothing is running here. There are a couple of images already there, which is the, you can see the GORP and the GORP, GORP Docker link image. It's actually, uh, these images were created using a very stupid. Docker file, which looks like this. It's like four lines. Just use the Golang base image, run, go, get, expose port, entry point, done. Uh, and the other one, the, the, the Docker link, is basically the same. It's even, even shorter. It's only three lines. Super cool. I like Docker. So let's run something, right? So. Let's run the GORP server first. So we need to run it in the privileged mode because it needs to access kernel to talk to IPVS. And we need to expose the host network so that it can actually configure it. Uh, no. Minus F means flush everything you have in IPVS right now and like start with, with a clean slate. And we're going to use interface Ethernet, Z, Ethernet 1 because Ethernet 0 is some virtual box crap I don't know about. So yay, it worked. So this is the daemon. Now it, it, it runs. Good. Uh, now we're going to run the Docker link.
We need to buy, bind Docker socket for it so that we can listen for Docker events. Uh, like that. Looks good, right? Yeah. This is the container name, and the options is interface Ethernet zero, and remote is the address of the of the GORB daemon. What was the port? Four six seven two. Okay, it runs. It connected to Docker, started listening for events. It already detected two containers, which is the, action, the, the GORB itself and the, uh, the, the, the Docker link which we just started. It kind of detected itself. So, but there is no public ports, so nothing is exposed. So let's expose something, right? So how about some Nginx? and we will expose a port. So we started Nginx, and you can see that the event arrived at the Docker link, and it, it wanted to create the, uh, the new backend, which is Nginx slash no team what? No team, I can't read that. Monulty? McNulty, okay, I don't know what that is. So this, it tried to create that with uh, port 80, on, on the load balancer and some private port that was mapped by Docker for you, but the service wasn't there, so it actually created the service for you which, with the name Nginx on port 80. So by default, it will take the image name as the service name and the private port number as the port number for the balancer. So, and it sent the, this, this kind of request to uh, the GORB daemon. And that's what happened here. So it created a virtual service Nginx on this IP address, this port, it created a backend, on this address for this virtual service, and it starts started a pulse for this for this backend. Pulse is the health check, so by default it will start the TCP health checks. It also supports the HTTP health checks if you want, and maybe later I can add things like console health checks, CTCD health checks, so like Zookeeper or something like that, right? So uh, it works. So let's actually send a request, right? Uh, so port 80, it said, right? Yay, Nginx. So, but it's a load balancer, so yeah, if this is a request. It's a load balancer, so let's start more Nginxes. No. So I tried to copy pass today, but I, I failed. Uh, Oh, now it works. Oh, sorry. More Nginxes. Oh, now, now I can't, can't copy pass. <laughs> okay. Oops. It, it, everybody does this type, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More engine access in more engine access, right? Never enough engine access. So now we have eight engine access, and it, they all register it as a backend for the engine service here with health checks and everything. So let's do load testing, right? Do I have IB? I have IB, cool. Let's send, I don't know. 1,000 requests, 32 threads, to HTTP, Docker machine, IP default, 80. Bam. Load balanced. Cool. It worked. <laughs> so, So yeah, it worked, and it was actually, uh, so what happened is that, so I used only one Docker host 
for, for, for this demo. So you obviously can make use more Docker hosts. You can use Swarm and overlay networking so that your containers can talk to each other. And then, for example, you can have one host with database, one host with whatever Redis or some queue, whatever. And you have some uh, like other host with your front end, and then you expose the port on your front end, and the Docker, the GORP Docker link will automatically figure it out that there is a port was exposed on your network, and it will send a request to your load balancer. Load balancer will automatically register this backend with IPVS, and your backend will be exposed and load balanced to the outside world, which is pretty cool. Uh, one thing I want to talk about before I continue is that uh, this is like one balancer, right? And it's not actually good because this is single point of failure and it's kind of bad practice and this balancer will go down at some point and you will lose all your clients and money and go bankrupt and have to be a homeless person in San Francisco, like all, all the failed startups. That's actually how homeless persons appeared in San Francisco, I think. So uh, to do something about this, people usually do some kind of redundancy, right? So for example, you can do uh, DNS load balancing for your load balancers, right? So you can have three boxes with load balancers. You can assign a single host name for them and three IP addresses so that when you resolve it, you'll have some IP address and you use it as a load balancer. But it's not cool. It's, it's old school. So uh, I'm going to talk about BGP a little bit. So uh, this is how this is supposed to work, I guess. So BGP is a protocol, is another network, not network, is another protocol which was around for many years as well. And this protocol is basically uh, in the heart of internet and internet. And if you have an internal network in your company, it probably is either BGP-based or OSPF-based. And if it's OSPF, tell your admins to make it BGP-based. So uh, it also powers internet. So if you heard words like internet exchange or autonomous system or something like that, or like peering, for example, that probably somehow involved BGP. So, but in this case, we won't actually do anything like that, like this fancy BGP with uh, like peering and internet exchanges. What we're going to talk about is the uh, BGP Anycast, the BGP host, host routes. So the idea is that you can have a BGP daemon on your Docker or on, the, on, your, on your load balancer hosts to announce an IP address to your network. And all the daemons on all your load balancers can announce the same IP address. And usually when you do that, like if you take two laptops and each of these laptops will configure the same IP address, then you'll probably have like IP address conflict and error and nothing will work. But in this case, it actually will work because what will happen is that it's not the box that will actually have this IP address. It's that the daemon will tell your routers and your network that, hey, I am the route to this IP address. I am the path you can use to reach this IP address. So when many, many nodes in the network will, t will say the same thing, the router will figure it out that, okay, so there are multiple paths I can use to reach this IP address, this four, five, 10, whatever boxes. So what will happen is that when the request will arrive from the client or some other service to this IP address, which is, which is your service address, the router will pick one of the paths based on the metrics it has. So the metrics can be like number of hops, the latency, the network delay, whatever. And it will pick one of the routes possible and send the request down to this route. And you don't need anything for this to work, basically. You don't need any special hardware. You, need, don't, need, you don't need any special tools or whatever. It's, everything is already built in, in, in your systems which is the case for IPVS, right? It, it's, in, it's actually in, in, even in boot to Docker kernel, right? So, which is like super reduced, but it's still there. So yeah, BGP Anycast routes is how you usually load balance load balancers. And the tools, the, the, uh, the, DIM, the BGP demos you can use to do that are, for example, Bird or Quagga, maybe you heard about them, which it's actually, it's, it's, not, it's not very complicated to configure that. It's like maybe one page of configuration file for Quagga and that's it, it will just work. So this is just like one note about how, how not to do single point of failure load balancer on your networks. So uh, 
you may be wondering how stable is this thing I, that I just showed you. So no, you cannot blame me and maybe it won't work. And the good thing about that is that IPVS is actually pretty stable. It was around for more than 15 years and it powers basically more than half of internet traffic in the world. And the BGP is pretty stable as well. And these two technologies, they've been stable since I was like in high school probably. So even, even before I, I had the computer, it was already stable. That was a long time ago. Uh, the GORB is obviously not stable, not production tested, not, not anything at all, but it has unit tests, like half of the code probably, 50% coverage is good enough. <laughs> but it will, it will be more later. Uh, and it's a, just a configuration daemon, so it it's actually it doesn't really do anything with the traffic. The only thing it does is actually talks to the IPVS through the Netlink interface and tells it to create or destroy the virtual servers and backends. So it probably will be fine if you want to use it. And if it's not fine, then I can answer questions. I'm available over email or whatever. Or you can just steal my code and rewrite it and use it in some other way you want if you want. And Another excuse for this being not stable is this quote. So uh, I can read it out loud. Uh, I let you in one a secret. My pet hamster did all the coding. It was just, I was just a channel, a front, if you will, in my pet's grand plan. So don't blame me if there are bugs. Blame the cute furry one. This quote is by Rusty Russell. Anybody knows who Rusty Russell is? So this guy, this is the guy who wrote NetFilter. So IP tables, you all use it. This is, this is what he said. So I can probably say the same thing, right? It, it was my pet, whatever, dog. So if it doesn't work, blame this guy. I actually don't have a dog. So uh, another thing uh, which is important about IPVS and BGP and all these technologies which are around us for so, 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 so much time and nobody knows about it is this. So this is the price for an enterprise hardware load balancer. So it, this price, I got it by Googling for like enterprise hardware load balancer. And it was, it, it's not even the median of the price. It's like in the lower, like bottom half. The price can go up to like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you pay this money for a box, right? A metal box that you put in your rack and it does exactly the same as a PVS. Exactly the same thing. But it may, maybe it has fancy UI and maybe it has, I don't know, a, like sticker, something like that. So, uh, I know a few companies, actually I know people from, some, from, from a few companies in, uh, in Silicon Valley, and you actually know these companies, but I'm not allowed to say the names of these companies, which uh, actually stopped using that and converted to IPVS load balancing and saved millions of dollars. And it works, and it actually works better than hardware box because obviously hardware box is a black box, right? You don't know how it works. You just put it in and it just works. And if it, if it breaks down, you have to call customer support premium if you're lucky so that you don't have to wait for five hours, maybe only 30 minutes, and they will tell you that you have to replace it. The replace will be in a month or something like that. So IPVS is kind of simple, simpler than that. And uh, do we have enterprise people here? Like banks? So is it a lie? Oh, the problem is uh, the license. Uh, it, it blocks you from certain uh, sessions or certain amount of connections. Oh, license. Device. Not, not even in the box can handle yeah. it, but this minimum. Okay, so, so you have to pay money so that it works. Yeah, like <laughs> around. So you have to feed dollars basically at a slot, right? Yeah, our company paid <laughs> like, like that. Uh, a half million. It's almost like that. So uh, yeah, this this. So I'm not lying. See, this is true. So uh, this is the price for IPVS and BGP and GORP. It's zero euros, zero dollars. It works on commodity hardware. You don't need anything special. You just take like a normal server 
and that's it. It already has APVS built in in Linux kernel, so you don't need to do anything. It just it's already there. Uh, there is no special software tools or anything like that. You, you, there is no SNMP as well. So if if you used SNMP ever in your life, you probably understand that it's a very good thing. Uh, you don't need to go through 100-page manual of vendor bullshit. You don't understand, and it's just maybe thousand-word man page. I, I didn't count, but it's pretty short. And this actually, this this fourth line is true as well. So IPVS in direct routing mode uses one percent CPU for one gigabyte per one GPPS line rate, basically. So uh, it's kind of free, more or less. And it doesn't make assumptions, like it doesn't tell you that it will accelerate your web traffic using marketing powers of the company you just paid or something like that. So it actually works fast, which is a good thing, right? So uh, this is a good way to spend 25,000 euros, I think. This is, this is Ibiza, it's like right here, right? So that's it. Anybody has any questions? All right, we'll start up front. So with the BGP announcement, does that work, for example, on Amazon in their data center with uh, Amazon virtual machines? I don't or, know. But could it work? Or it, it could work. OK. But it depends then on the vendor of the, the cloud I, infrastructure. I, I mean, I actually, I didn't use Amazon that much. So I'm not sure how it actually works in network infrastructure. But as far as I know, there are these virtual private networks. And maybe it actually allows you to do that. And I don't know. OK. Maybe. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you had a matrix comparing different load balancers and so on. And sort of a, a row I was missing there was scriptability. You did a, um, a benchmark. Scriptability? Scriptability, yeah. You did a benchmark against the MySQL proxy. Yeah. But something that the MySQL proxy does that I don't know if, and that's my question, better IPVS can do, is something like a MySQL connection has state, like you can store glo uh, variables on a connection, uh, transactions, things like that. So if you switch the connection, do failovers yeah. at that layer, uh, that's something that you could probably, yeah, you need to script with something like MySQL proxy. Can you script IPVS to do something like a MySQL failover on a stateful connection? So IPVS has a persistent mode for that kind of things. I think that's the question, right? So basically, when you have a state with this with, which is associated with the connection, right, with, like, with, the, with the client, then if you use persistent mode for IPVS, it will make sure that the same client will hit the same box all the time. But what if I want to fail over that box due to a failure? If, if, it, if, you, if you'll fail this box, then the state will be lost, right? Because the state is on the box. Is that? The... Right, and then you close the connection and so on. Yeah, you close the connection and you set up another connection that is still a persistent connection, so it will, again, make sure that the client will, still, will, will hit this new box all the time until this box go down. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, will this approach work with uh, swarm and private networking, uh, overlay networking as well, right? Yeah, so it will. So the idea is that it's kind of two orthogonal things. So you can have your private network configured with uh, like Weave or something else, or the built-in overlay networking in Docker, and your containers can talk to each other do some things and whatever. And then at some point, you just, on one of the containers, you expose a port. And the, uh, the, the, the Docker link, for example, will detect that there is a port exposed. And it will tell the GORB daemon to register this backend for a service. So for example, if you swarm, you do like, spawn me 10 containers, right? So 10 containers will spin up on different machines. And all of them will have this port 80, for example, exposed. And if all these machines have the Docker link, it will tell the load balancer to register this port 80, like these 10 backends 
to register them with the load balancer. There's kind of two things. Uh, the health checking in uh, GORP, is that, uh, are those health checks actually executed by GORP? Yeah, uh, the so. Uh, so not, not in IPVS. IPVS doesn't, doesn't actually you know, send the HTTP requests. So part of IPVS is Keep Alive D, part of the same project. This is the thing that does health checks and configuration and everything like that. But Keep Alive D, so basically GORP is like Keep Alive D button go and with HTTP interface, right? So IPVS has health checks because it has Keep Alive D, which has health checks, which is a part of the same stack, kind of. And these health checks in GORP, they're actually implemented by me, so they might not work, but still, yeah, this, this, like, this is two very basic things. Like open a socket, connect. If it's good, then it's good. If it's not good, then kill the backend. Set it wait to, wait to zero. And HTTP is like, go to this path, issue a get request. If there is a 200 response, it's good. If it's not 200, then it's bad. Set the weight of the backend to zero. I have a question. How can you handle with SSL traffic with that? So it operates on layer four, so it just transparent to SSL, you just do it. Yeah. I mean, you, you can, you can you, if you don't use persistent connections, then keep alive kind of works. I mean, it works from the back end, from, from the load balancer to the back end, but if you use persistent connections, then you'll have these persistent routes and everything like that. And yeah, SSL, SSL just works out of the box because it's a different layer. I have, I have a question. Uh, if you want to configure sticky sessions, for example, would it be possible? Yeah, you can use persistent, persistent connections again for that. Which yeah. is, it's, it's, it's basically sticky sessions. Okay. It's and just a different name. And another question is, uh, now with Docker 1.9, we have the network interfaces, so uh -huh. we can have multiple networks. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to create a public interface and a, private, a pr public network and a private network so that you can have a front end and a back end? in different proxies? Yeah, so they, like my idea about that was that you uh, actually, so it, for, in, in, in new Docker you can have multiple networks for each container, right? So you can have one network which is the overlay network, right? Like you can say so that all my containers should join the overlay network to talk to each other, right? And also they all have to join, for example, the uh, Mac VLAN network, which will be the public facing interface. And since they're all in the Mac VLAN network, they have separate MAC addresses, like each container will have a separate MAC address. And since they all have separate MAC address, you can use direct routing, the IPVS direct routing, which is like super, extremely fast, which is good. Last so, yeah. question. So following on from that then, if you had a bunch of um, uh, web apps, for example, running on a, on a box um, in containers, and they were joining that VLAN interface, um, then that network, sorry, then um, given that um, IPVS runs so lightweight, could you run it on, on, the, on the actual box and it would then load balance across the containers on that box? Yeah, you could do that. And then you could use global load balancing across all the boxes. Yeah, it, it can be done like that too. You can run IPVS on each box to load balance across the instances of the, yeah. instances of the service on one box, or you can have like one big load balancer to load balance everything, or you can have a few load balancers somewhere in the network that will share the responsibility. Yeah. Okay, quick follow up. Um, hardware load balancers and, well, software, ones that you pay 25 grand for, um, also give you the ability to script uh, various things that happen, uh, that you can do to the request as it comes through, not just root, root upon all kinds of data that's in there, but also make changes to the contents, um, log things, all kinds of stuff. Can, is there anything in IPVS that lets you do that? So you can modify the contents. So it's, it's a forwarder, basically. So it forwards things. The things that exist in IPVS, which I didn't mention, is that it has a lot of stats. So it basically dumps a lot of metrics from the uh, virtual servers and the backends you configured. You can send it to Graphite, whatever, in FluxDB or something like that. So it, it basically includes like everything you can imagine, like the number of packets, number of bytes, where, what was rooted, how, when, like everything like that. Uh, logs, there are no logs. So there will be no access logs 
So if you want access logs, you have to do it somewhere else. And for packet modification, well, you kind of can do that if you use some sort of probably weird IP tables rules. So you can actually modify the contents of the packets because from the point of IPVS, it's like it's an IP packet. So it's like rewrite bytes or something like that. It's kind of hard to script that kind of things. I mean, the packet modification is usually done on the application level, like layer seven, when, you, for example, you already have HTTP and you know like this is the header, this is the body, so you can actually do something useful, right? On, on layer four, it's just some bytes, so it's not really easy to know where to modify things. Hey, There's no, no access logs. We, we have another session coming in, so if you want to keep talking, you can just come to the side of the stage. But thank you, everyone, for coming.